everybody back to an episode of Between Bears and Bulls. My name is Angel Vasquez. I am here with our professor Everton Thompson and our guest, our expert in economics and finances, Yinka Majekadumi. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, today we'll be covering the topics of different investment vehicles uh, when it comes to uh, whether it comes to stocks, options, forex, uh, etc. Uh, professor Thompson, if you'd like to explain the episode a little more. Well, at some point, we're all going to get, make some money. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> we're going to make some money. Now, what do you do with that money, right? Mm -hmm. You're working. You may have come into some inheritance. You may have looked under a mattress. <laughs> <laughs> and anyway, you could win the lotto, too. You could win the lotto, right? Yep. What do we do with that money? What, how do we do it smartly? Mm -hmm. So we're going to have that conversation today about what do you do? With those funds. Mm -hmm. um, remember, we're here today to try to touch on topics and provide some insight and some foundation towards investing and financial, you know, using your money wisely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, we're not giving you investment advice. <laughs> I ain't told you about betting on nothing. But <laughs> what we are trying to do is we're trying to steer you and let you understand it. It's, it's not as simple as it may think. You have mm -hmm. all this money. What do I do with it? Mm -hmm. um, and a matter of fact, uh, Yinka, um, would, we could start out the segment like that. What would be, who should we look at if we're seriously needing to know, I've got $100,000 just came my way. Mm -hmm. Who should I be talking to first? What are the people I should, and what are their credentials and their, and their expertise? Well, the, the, the good thing is there's a lot of people to talk to. Um, the, the, the most important thing that I tell people to look for is licensed professionals. Not your uncle, Tom, that, you know, used to sell stocks in the 80s. Not your friend who watched a few, a few videos on YouTube. <laughs> exactly. Um, Everybody got advice from you. Right, buddy. right. <laughs> I think you should seek professionals and, and licensed professionals specifically because they have some guiding principles on how they operate. They have some oversight on what type of advice they could give and they have some level of uh, fiduciary duty, which is one of the things that I value the most when I tell people to look for an advisor is that you want a professional that has some fiduciary duty because you could be a financial advisor, but you may not have fiduciary duty. Um, so you want a financial advisor that's independent, that's just there to give you advice on your options not someone who is there to sell you something because you have financial advisors who also sell you products. Um, and, you know, there's reasons why they may sell certain products over other products. Mm -hmm. Just like you have investment managers who may want to have more churn on, on, on selling and buying just to be able to charge you more management fees. So you want a, a fiduciary uh, duty to exist in your relationship. And obviously when we talk about investing, it goes hand in hand with taxation. So you also should get a CP at some point. You know, your investment person is designed to help you make the best decision for investment, understand the market, make the right moves, but also investing has tax implications. So you also want to cover that ground with a licensed CPA mm -hmm. uh, that could kind of give you some guidance on what your options are for taxation. That's my preference. Um, and obviously, if you get too confused, you should be able to get advice from your bank. Um, the brokerage should be able to uh, give you someone who's assigned to help give you some mm -hmm. high level, broad view on what your options should look like. Uh, keep in mind that banks also have their own incentives, right, to sell products, so. Mm -hmm. um, what's the definition, let me make sure we're clear, the, the definition of fiduciary? Fiduciary is somebody who uh, is responsible for you and the advice they give you. Okay. Which means their responsibility is to protect your interest. Right. right? not to sell you the product that gives them the highest commission, um, not to divert you into a product that may give them more management fees. Correct. Their first priority is to protect your interests. So they should have fiduciary duty. And there's financial advisors who uh, you could pay a fee for service and the fee for service kind of gives you a little bit more um, coverage on the fiduciary duty side, which and, is what you want. And they do get, they do have penalty if they don't do that, right? Oh, absolutely. There's legal ramifications of that. You know, there's professional ramifications of that. So I think any licensed professional knows when you're 
bound by fiduciary duty, you, you have to operate in a certain way. Option. Abs- absolutely. Sounds good. Sounds good. And, you know, I'd, I'd like to uh, also, now that we know or we have an act, uh, a kind of a clear understanding of the terms of fiduciary and what we're discussing here, you know, I'd kind of like to start it off with going uh, with a little bit of an overview, uh, overview of different investment vehicles. So we could start off with something uh, such as stocks, for example. Well, stocks is the most common. We hear about stocks uh, from probably when we're kids. Sometimes we don't even understand what it means, but mm-hmm. that is the most common way to get into investment uh, because the other tiers of investment have a level of complexity involved in it. Stocks may seem to be more simpler. You could either buy a stock of a company, mm-hmm. follow the company. Even as a child, you could probably buy a stock as a child. You like uh, companies' movies, you buy the stocks of that company, and hopefully when you get older, the price that you bought has appreciated and you made some money. Uh, so normally stocks are the easiest way. And there's so many platforms now where you could just buy a stock. Now, I don't personally advocate individual stock picking mm-hmm. as you go down the line of your investment uh, life cycle. But to start, if you just want to get comfortable with the idea, you could buy a stock for Five dollars and just get comfortable with the notion, understand how to read the tools within your platform that you're using, whatever platform you're using, and just uh, get away from being a novice, right? Mm-hmm. You want to just start somewhere. And then as you, you know, evolve, you may make better decisions. You may be able to understand how to allocate, you know, asset allocation and trying to make sure you're well balanced. You're not putting all your funds in the stocks of similar companies and mm-hmm. similar industries you kind of get a little bit more advanced mm-hmm. as you go along with stock. But the first thing, when you say the easiest entry point is just um, mm-hmm. try to buy a stock for a very low cost just to get familiar with the tools and the, the lingo, because uh, that's what intimidates a lot of people, mm-hmm. the lingo in the industry. Mm-hmm. But when you buy stocks, you're forced to learn this, uh, the lingo and the terminologies that help you. And so you could advance from there to more complex structures. Mm-hmm. And those complex structures are more pricier, they're more expensive. Uh, you know, you, you, you know I, I guess we could continue into, you know, when you talk about stocks as a direct investment, right? You could get into more complex indirect investments, whether it's, uh, you know, private equity or mutual funds and, you know, CDs and things of that mm-hmm. nature where now uh, over a period, of, and ETFs, obviously, e- ETFs, you know, I segue into ETFs because ETFs are, a little bit more um, risk diversification strategy mm-hmm. because they're not putting all the funds into one specific stock. Mm-hmm. ETFs is a combination depending on the type of uh, objective, right? Maybe it's pegged to a specific type of industry, pegged to a market, but it, it pretty much spreads your risk for you um, mm-hmm. in, in, a, in a more uh, seamless way. Yeah. But more importantly, it also, and we'll talk about mutual funds, it has, has low management fees a, a lot of times because it's normally passively managed. And, mm-hmm. and we could get into that because that's a key factor in the advantage and disadvantages of in, investing or the investment vehicle you choose. Certain investment vehicles have very high fees because it's directly managed by an individual, right, who's helping you day-to-day manage your stocks, manage your investment portfolio. But ETFs could buy pieces of 100 companies, mm-hmm. right? And it's passively managed, but you know you're indexed to a certain fund or you're indexed or you're diversified across industries. So you feel as though, you know, your relationship with a individual manager is less, mm-hmm. right? You, you, you just have a seamless relationship with your investment, which is close to passive as possible, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, because somebody is doing all that work for you behind the scenes. But all you have to do is find the actual fund. So from my perspective, I think you start with, with stocks, which is easy, low impact. And then if you, you know, like uh, I, I think Professor Thompson said, you come across a large sum of money, maybe you want to diversify more and you haven't got into the habit of having a very strong diversification strategy. And you don't need to, because if you're a doctor, you probably shouldn't spend your time doing that, right? You mm-hmm. should just mm-hmm. let the market tools work for you in the extreme trade of funds and you'll be diversified and you just buy it like you buy shares, but, but you're, you're able to seamlessly do these things as opposed to you trying to figure out which companies to pick, uh, which industries to select from, what portion of your money you should put into them. Mm-hmm. It, 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 investment can get complicated. Mm-hmm. So you kind of get into the ETFs from that standpoint. 
You know, the philosophy of investing seems to, to me, have changed since I was younger, you know. Which was not a long time ago, right? (laughs) 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 You ever seen the Flintstones? (laughs) I was there. Um, But we, in the beginning, it was supposed to be long term. Mm -hmm. You put your money and you watched it grow. You know, you watched it grow. And then there was a point, I think this was in the 2000s, early 2000s, where day trading began. And people were um, making, well, first of all, in corporate America, putting a little business into this, Mm -hmm. corporate America went from, you know, looking annually at your results to looking quarterly. And, And companies making decisions quarter by quarter based on stock prices and mm-hmm. whether or not they're going to hit their revenue numbers or not. So now it became shorter period, right? And then at the same time, what came about was, you know, this day training, electronic trading, you know, at our fingertips. Like you said, I think you said last show before, you had to go find someone to invest your money. You had to mm-hmm. go, okay, mm-hmm. where can you find? Phone book. Do you know a stockbroker <laughs> I can call, right? Mm-hmm. No more, right? You can literally put that $100,000 that I found under my mattress <laughs> into a fund online. Yes. Right? Um, so I'm, I'm, I wanted to get an understanding as what is the proper mindset that a young person needs to think about before they even get into investing. Right. Yeah. So, so I think last episode I said something that I always repeat. You need to know who you are first. Right. Right? And it goes the same way in, in, in investing. I'll say this. Investing is not gambling. Okay. If you display gambling behavior, you're probably not investing. And, and maybe there's a chemical reaction that you get from day trading. Mm-hmm. And, um, but the data doesn't support the idea that day trading is beneficial to retail investors. Why am I saying that? A few studies that's come out in the most recent years show that retail investors, quote unquote, day traders, mm-hmm. underperform the market 90% of the time. Wow. So what that means is, when you watch TV or you're watching YouTube videos, if you watch 10 videos of people who proclaim to be very good day traders, 90% of them, 9 out of 10 of them, underperform the market, which means I could put my money in an ETF to index at the S&P 500, and in 10 years, I'll perform better than the day traders. Mm-hmm. That is data. That is proven. That makes sense to me because if you give me the keys to a race car mm-hmm. and have me go on a racetrack right. against a professional race car driver, <laughs> right. I will underperform 100% of the time. Right. <laughs> exactly. Even though they're all left turns. So it exactly. makes 100% Exactly. Sense. So, so b- because what are day traders doing? Day traders are using platforms to try to determine what to sell and what to buy. Mm-hmm. What they don't understand most of the time, and maybe they do and they just don't have any risk aversion, but is that what they're uh, competing against are computerized systems. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because the people that are professionals use computer systems to do this in fractions of seconds, Mm -hmm. right? Why you with your five monitors on the beach (laughs) proclaiming to be a day trader, buying and selling things at, uh, you know, uh, different random sentiment levels and, you know, using whatever fundamentals you're using to make the decision, you, can't, you just can't compete, right? You mm-hmm. can't compete, and it's proven yeah. as the result of studies that they never beat the market. And we're not just talking about a fractional percentage. We're talking about big, big percentage differences. Mm-hmm. S&P 500 does 10% over 10 years. Day traders are doing 6%. And so we're, we're going to get into compounding, right? Mm-hmm. That delta of 4% could be millions for some people, depending on your portfolio mm-hmm. balance, right? So for, from my perspective... I really hardly ever encourage day trading. Maybe if you want to buy a couple of stocks and just get used to the market, but as far as sitting in front of the computer um, every day, day trading, just for the purpose of trying to beat the market, um, data says otherwise. Data says you're better off being passive, putting it into an ETF or some professionally managed fund, and you know, uh, let the interest do the work for you. 
Uh, so that's that's my 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 advice to okay. to to kids is that probably it's best not to spend your time trying to day trade. Um, all of us have skill sets. If you're a doctor, you have no business day trading. If you're you know lawyer, you have no business. Do what you do best to earn income and let the <laughs> income invest be invested in a vehicle that you could passively attend to. That's my sentiment. This nine out of ten, by the way, nine out of ten <laughs> on the from the market. I'm not, uh, I may be going a little bit off topic, but I ju it's just something I thought about when I was doing some, I know we talked a little bit about um, spending, you remember your analogy you did last episode where you talked about on the drive home, you'll see 20 things telling you how to spend money mm -hmm. and none telling you how to invest, invest money. Mm -hmm. I, I want to make sure we're not stepping over saving money. Right. Because you have spending money, s saving money, or investing, or do you consider saving and investing the same thing? They're, they're, That's my question. They're similar because generally speaking, right, from, from the financial sense, there's two categories of people, spenders and savers, right? Right. Um, and savers of money end up being investors, right? Okay. Because they have the capital. Spenders are the ones who either borrow money or need the money to spend. So, so I normally, I don't distinguish savers from investors because the savers are the ones who become invest, investors potentially. But won't savers, I mean, my, my, my mom believed in banks. I'm going to stick it in the bank. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm going to get my 2 or 3% right. and I'm never going to touch it. Right. Okay. So I, there is a little bit of a jump between being a saver and being a investor. Investor, yeah. And I guess the difference is, and that's why we're talking about these different vehicles, mm -hmm. the level of risk. Right. Good. Yes. Right. Yes. So that's absolutely. That's, so that's where we're going. I want a very good point. Yeah. yeah. Very very good point. Yeah. So the risk comes from the type of vehicle, not necessarily the act of saving. Because I could save my money in an investment account. Mm -hmm. So I think you we're talking about the type of vehicle now. Because mm -hmm. if you put your one million dollars that you found on your mattress in a savings account, only two fifty is FDIC insured. Mm -hmm. The bank goes barely up. You're still protected to a certain number. Mm -hmm. And then you may have a guaranteed interest rate very, very low over a period of time. Now, if you put that same money in the market, your exposure is 100%, right? You could lose everything. Now, your upside is also... 100%. 1,000%. Like, if I bought NVIDIA, mm -hmm. NVIDIA stock 10 years ago, I would probably be a millionaire right now. If I bought $10,000 worth, I would be probably over a million dollars, you know, in return, well, whatever the calculation is. Mm -hmm. The point is your, your, your upside is indefinite, right? Your downside is 100%, but your upside could be whatever performance the company stock, uh, you know, is, uh, is successful in, in making. The reason why I'm saying that is, is the actual vehicle that determines um, risk, right? And as it's saying that most of you are probably familiar with, is like, you know, high yeah. risk, high rewards, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. as you, can't, you can't do it any other way. So if you put it in a savings account, if you put 250 in a savings account, yeah, you're protected. If the bank disappears, you're still protected for your 250. You may get your minor interest, which is mm -hmm. a different conversation entirely because sometimes if the interest rate is lower than the inflation rate, you're actually losing money. Like some people lost money last year when inflation mm -hmm. was high and the banks are giving them a certain percentage. Okay, mm -hmm. keep that in mind when, you, when you're protected. You're not gonna get any upside. But if you invest it, you have a high upside, but you also have a, a high risk. And you just keep that in mind. You know, it's good that you mentioned that because you know, we, we just covered stocks, right? We just covered that uh, the risk you take is whatever you put in, right? And you just uh, discussed right quick that when you put into, into an account, your FDIC insured up to 250 right. plus whatever uh, small amount of interest that they give you. But when looking at other uh, investment vehicles, such as commodities, for example, that they tend to be very... Uh, they tend to be subject to more global matters. They're not just a, a national level thing, right? The, the demand of oil and how you're trading uh, futures or, you know, spots in oil, yes. that's very subjective to what another country is doing, what's happening in their, in their political world. And the same thing happens when you're doing uh, Forex, right? Absolutely. When you're doing Forex, you're, it's a geopolitical matter because now it's what I have, uh, whatever happens within the country plus whatever the country is subjected to by a bunch of other nations. Exactly. So if we could, you know, I'd, I'd like to actually discuss to the, the risks that you take on with those, because to my knowledge, I know Forex is, the risk is incredibly larger 
Yes. The reward is also a lot larger. Exactly. Uh, and the rate or the, the speed at which these actions happen are way faster right. compared to, you know, if you, if you trade the stock market here in the U.S., you're just limited to it opened at 930 and it closed at, at four. Yes. So. So, so, so you're right. Those markets, those alternative investments are, are definitely a, a little bit more high risk. Um, and they're not FDIC insured, by the way. You lose, you lose it all. Um, but whether deciding whether you want to get into the futures market, forward market, Forex, and, and all this um, involve a broader understanding of global issues, mm -hmm. right? Um, because they're impacted by global issues. Um, as opposed to a stock where you could just buy the company's stock, yeah, maybe impacted by global issue, but the company essentially, the performance is kind of indicative of, you know, what the outlook could look could be. That's why a lot of the analysts used financial information to kind of predict what the outlook looks like. Now, when we talk about Forex, there's so much other instances of issues that come in play, mm -hmm. right? From one day to the next, there's no such thing as a good fundamental for Forex, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Because even the U.S. dollar shocks us sometimes, right? When you, yep. when you talk about the Forex market. So you have to get some specialization. And this will fall into the category of more complex investment vehicles, mm -hmm. right? Bec you know, it's even saying a lot to call them investment vehicles, but nonetheless, they're, they're, they're ways to, to create hedge, mm -hmm. right? And, and, and different ways to create hedge um, using forward market, because the think about it, the, 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 I'll give you this notion. Why did this market exist in the first place, right? It was literally to, to create hedge because the farmer who's growing something that's mm -hmm. going to mature in one year mm -hmm. doesn't know how much he's going to sell. Mm -hmm. So what he has to do is create this forward contracts or this future contracts or this different scenarios to get someone to say, I will buy two tons of crops from you in a year from now for mm -hmm. $5 a pound. Now, in a year, those things will be worth $10 a pound. Mm -hmm. Or they could be worth $1 a pound. But if you're the farmer, you have a guaranteed sale. Mm -hmm. So you're hedging yourself against potential sitting on 50,000 tons of crops and there's nobody to buy it. So these contracts came from those need where you need to hedge your bets and protect yourself. Now, just like currency, we trade them as though investment vehicles, but they literally were designed for a purpose, mm -hmm. right? And so I'm, I'm using that example just to lay the foundation of what those things were actually meant to do. They were meant to, to create some protection from the farmer, the person who's mining gold, he has no idea, you know, how much gold is gonna mine, uh, the person who's, uh, you know, perfect example, a couple of years ago when beef was scarce, right? Mm -hmm. You know, people who are, the, 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 the cattle uh, rearing process takes a long time mm -hmm. from, from inception to, but if you have a contract, someone is gonna buy from you a year from now for X amount of dollars, you still, you still guarantee some income, right? Um, now it could go up, it could go down, but you've, pretty much had your mm -hmm. sale. That's the idea. So those things are more complicated because of the way we use them now. Not, they weren't designed to be just traded like that. Mm -hmm. But obviously now we could, we could trade them, right? Because if I have this guaranteed crop and it's $5 and I buy it from you and Miss Professor Thompson comes along and at a time it's like $10, I'm being I'm mm -hmm. willing to sell something <laughs> <laughs> for a higher price. So it becomes this tra financial transaction that could continue you know, into different uh, paths, right? Mm -hmm. But from your perspective, you the farmer, you've hedged your bets. Yeah. You've hedged mm -hmm. yourself, you're protected, your sales are done. And um, I don't want to be too basic, but I want to make sure I'm, what we're talking about with basic stocks is you're, you're, you're investing in companies, right? right? Mm -hmm. And uh, when we're talking about commodities, we're talking about goods, yes, farm goods, mm -hmm. gold, silver, where you think wheat, it's corn, wheat. corn. So, um, and and when we're talking about forex, it's foreign exchanges. Mm -hmm. Right. Where are their dollars in in respect to others? Right. Mm -hmm. Right. So all which of is these, the same concept. Which is the same concept. Absolutely. So what we're so that is why you said it's so important to get a professional here because to sit there all day <laughs> and watch these. Mm -hmm. And understand the history, the political situation, mm -hmm. um, the climate change, the tech this technology affects each industry yes. too, mm -hmm. right? 
Um, it's, it's a disaster, lot. natural disaster. Natural they can disaster, predict. unpredict. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you're going to, as what you're saying, if you're going to invest wisely, you need to make sure that you're, in, you're, you're having somebody around you that has the knowledge to give mm -hmm. you sound advice. Yes. Why we don't do it. We shouldn't be sitting there doing it on our own. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, right. And, you know, it's kind of now trying to move on a little bit from this topic because I, I like that you've mentioned, you know, there's, there's a beginner way to, to edit, rather, not to edit, to, oh, to invest, and then there are more complex manners, more professional manners. Right. And, you know, as Professor Thompson mentioned, right, you know, these are all different manners. These are all different ways uh, to pick up, uh, but they're all ways to, to, instead of having your money just sitting under the mattress, you kind of put it to work, as they like to say, and it tries and it generates you more money or it loses you money, depending on the strategy. So if we could discuss a little bit real quick some the beginner methods to the complex methods, because you, you said we have right, stocks, you buying a few stocks as a beginner, but I know stocks also diverges into getting options, right? It's still stocks, but it's a little more, uh, I'm not going to say advanced, but it's a little more intermediate level. Right. Right, because to, to my understanding, stocks is a, it's a contract, it's a form of derivative that allows you the right to have 100 shares of you know, whatever stock, uh, what, yeah, shares of whatever stock, or whatever company, uh, but it doesn't exactly give you these shares just flat out. And I know you have the basic options where you do, you have put options implying it's gonna go down, call options implying it's gonna go up, and then you, you have all the other strangles, straddles, iron butterflies, condors, et cetera. Uh, and then we just discussed a little more advanced methods such as Forex, which are a uh, very worldwide affected matter, right? They have mm -hmm. a numerous amount of things. Last year, for example, you know, I believe we saw the, the pound sterling just kind of get into parity with the American dollar. Right. And I believe we had the same issue with the Euro, right. which at that point in time made it much cheaper for Americans to travel to to uh, Europe and the UK. Right. Uh, so if we could discuss these different complex matters and maybe a few other manners, because there are people who like to invest into uh, you know, ETFs and mutual funds, right. which they sound easy, right? Because it's a much more passive manner, right. but then also selecting what type of ETF, maybe someone wants to specialize in an ETF that for uh, you know, the medical sector. Mm -hmm. uh, right now we're seeing a lot of ETFs and funds that are basing themselves on cryptocurrencies. So yes. we could discuss that. Good point. So definitely ETFs are designed to do the work for you, like I said earlier. Um, so I don't know if we should talk about the complex ones because ETF seems to me to be a simpler topic mm -hmm. when it comes to investment um, because it's passively managed. It's more automation behind it. But the Forex scenario or the option scenario they're still essentially designed as hedges, right? So mm -hmm. there's a hedge component underlying that. Even if you work for someone and you want to buy, a they give you a stock option, right? What stock options are essentially saying, hey, you could buy this stock six months from now mm -hmm. for a dollar. Mm -hmm. That's the option. You're like, yeah, good deal. You shake hands, you're excited. You could buy a million dollars worth of these and six months for a dollar a piece. Mm -hmm. Now, in six months, if that stock is worth 20 cents, would you complete that option? Uh, implying that I still get them for cheaper than what I no, was going No, 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 your contract is to buy it for a dollar. Oh. But then in six months, but six months come mm -hmm. and the stock is worth 20 cents, not a dollar. Oh no, because it, at that point I'm losing 80 exactly. cents on the dollar. You're, gonna, you, you're, not, you're not gonna complete that option transaction. Mm -hmm. But in six months, if that same stock that you have the option in your hand, option contract to buy for five dollars, mm -hmm. no, to buy for a dollar is now five dollars. You're gonna be excited to mm -hmm. complete that transaction. But think of it as this, these are all options. And this goes with the same example of the farmer, right? Mm -hmm. You've sold it for a price. Yes, in one year, could that price go up or down? Absolutely but you've been assured to get a certain number. Forex is the same thing. The only, the only thing that Forex is more, is more broad because there's you know, international components of Forex because you're literally comparing the performance of one currency against the currency of another country, mm -hmm. and you're trying to figure out what's the best price point for you, right? So, hey, I'll buy, a do, I'll buy $100 from you for this exchange rate. 
And in the future, if that exchange rate changes, I'm, I'm going to be out of money. I'm mm-hmm. not going to be in the money, right? So, so all these things are designed to have these contracts in a way where your goal, essentially, is to protect a certain amount, right? Mm-hmm. To hedge yourself from a certain type of loss. Now, can you be the beneficiary? Yes. Can you be on the losing side? Of course. But those are very complex because they require a little bit more niche skill. Right? Mm-hmm. These are all niche, very niche because Forex is niche. Crypto, crypto is niche, mm-hmm. if I have to be honest with you. Gold could be niche, right? There's a lot of things that could be niche. You need to understand the industry. So these are not necessarily things that I would advise a novice to start unless you mm-hmm. want to dedicate time. But it's not something like a doctor who has a million dollars from his mm-hmm. doctor business should start learning how to trade Forex and should travel in the future. That's not my recommendation, at least. If you want to do it, fine, but that's not my recommendation, right? So those things, I put them in the bucket of more complex mm-hmm. um, ways of going about um, investing. And I'm using investing you know, in very loosely here because those things are designed to be more of a broader strategy of investing, right? Nobody just says, I want to, be, I want to invest, so I'm just going to stop buying all these options, mm-hmm. right? You mm-hmm. normally use it to hedge to prevent losses, especially if you're, if you're a portfolio manager, you want to use that to protect, to protect your investors, right? And so it's different. Can you use it as an individual? Of course. Now, from an individual perspective, you go into more one-on-one relationship with either a company stock or an entity that's investing for you, whether it's the mutual funds. And in the mutual funds, you know, we could unpack that even more. It's open-ended and it's mm-hmm. closed-end. And... All that does is it tells you whether you could easily buy and sell them, right? Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. you asked about the advantages and disadvantages are really like, clearly we know the advantages of stocks. Mm-hmm. Very easy to buy and sell. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, the liquidity is a little bit on the high side. So mutual funds are not that easy. Private equity is almost impossible, mm-hmm. right? So the, the higher tiers you go, you just can't call your, if you're in a closed-end mutual fund, maybe you can't just sell and buy when you need your funds, when you need liqui- liquidity. So you have to be cautious of that. So those are the things that you have to advise yourself. Tax issues aside, mm-hmm. decide what your preferences are. And that's when two key terms comes in play. What is your risk appetite? Okay. And what is your risk tolerance? Mm-hmm. Those are the okay. key criteria that determine how you want to choose your investment vehicle. Sometimes you may have an appetite, but your tolerance is not that high. You, you, know, you mm-hmm. can have a, a high appetite, but you know, your, your tolerance is, 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 not, is, not, uh, is not high enough, right? Mm-hmm. So, so two things you have to determine, what's your risk appetite and what's your risk tolerance as you decide which investment vehicle to use because once you go down a certain path, it may be difficult for you to, to maintain a certain, number, a certain amount of liquidity mm-hmm. um, for another opportunity. We don't have to get into opportunity costs today and all the other nuances of where you put your money, but those are the issues. Stocks, easy, buy and sell, mm-hmm. right, online platform. Mutual funds, it depends, right? It's not as easy. And then you have disadvantages when it comes to actively managed mutual funds, which has high management fees because somebody is doing this every day. Somebody's mm-hmm. doing the day trading for mm-hmm. you and doing the hedging for you. So you're paying a higher management fee. Or <laughs> private equity, which is a completely different ballgame because you're, you're paying a huge amount of fees um, with the idea that somebody who's a professional is finding companies, opportunities, things to invest in, and they're giving you a higher return than the market because it makes no sense for you to pay more fees when the returns are lower than the market. Otherwise you could buy an ETF index to the S and P 500 Mm -hmm. and you're done. S and P 500 gives you 10% in 10 years. You're fine. If your private equity (laughs) gives you 6%, are you, are you doing better? Maybe not. Mm Yeah. There's still a huge upside, but these are the decision is, the returns, right? I think we always forget that because, you know, I, I, so I was talking to somebody the other day and they said, I made $10,000 selling bit whatever, mm-hmm, like, mm-hmm. a cryptocurrency. And I'm like, how much did you lose? To the, make those 10000 To make that, like, oh. And then they started going through it and said, what's your net gain or net loss? Mm-hmm. They actually had a net loss. But in their mind, because they thinking today, like, look, I'm doing very good. I'm like, yeah, you made that today. Mm-hmm. But what is your your overall overall yeah, right? It's yes. up and down. Well, like, that's that's the same thing that gamblers go through, right? <laughs> Literally, <laughs> they, they 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 win a big amount of money, and Literally. they and they they uh, like, I'm so excited about it. Mm-hmm. But overall, You've over lost. the long term, 
the casinos got you. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they they right. got you. Um, and that's I, that's very important. I, I, I'll do a tax plug on that for for I don't advocate gambling. <laughs> right. No. <laughs> but gamblers should know you should if you ever win big, you could also write off your losses. Oh okay. your wins. Just I, and, a tax and I, plug. Good to know. And I think, <laughs> I, I, I think if you have an opportunity to write off your losses, and I think in future big. segments, you, we're, we're going to be talking about tax, yes, tax, yes. Mm -hmm. taxes and how that affects your investments Absolutely. and whatsoever. And it, and it seems that <clears throat> some of the stuff you're talking about, I, I hear you loud and clear when you say, you know, um, some things are passive, mm -hmm. right? You may not you may not get as much reward, but it's passive. It's mm -hmm. safe. You let someone else do it, and then. There are things that are going to be a little bit more complex. They're going to charge you some more fees, and there's more risk. And so that's why it's so important that, you know, as we said in the beginning, we can't give advice to anyone mm -hmm. because everyone has a different, um, what's the word you use, risk tolerance? The risk yes. tolerance, yes. <laughs> yes. It's like pain tolerance? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's a fact. There's a pain tolerance, That's you know? a fact. And so you have to find what's what's best for you. But the great thing about this conversation is we're talking about what are your options. Mm -hmm. It's up to you to go ahead and find out which one is best for you. Right. You know, and it, it's good, too, that we cover these things because, uh, you know, one of the things you both mentioned is so there is a risk tolerance, right? Uh, and I believe the other one was a uh, risk aversion, risk appetite, risk, risk appetite, appetite yeah. risk appetite, and risk tolerance. Yeah. And it's good because I look at it in terms of you know what's the pros and what are the cons. Right. And you know your, if you have a high risk tolerance, you know sure you uh, investments with higher risk in theory have a higher return. Right. But the con side is you're going to have a massive loss if right. you lose. Right. And good point. The risk appetite is also you know what are. I guess, per se, you know, as I'm understanding it, what are people willing to, right. to go after right. with the risk? I'll give you a great, good analogy, right? We talked about day trading earlier, right? Mm -hmm. And every day trader swears they have a high risk appetite. <laughs> they swear by it. They say, I, yeah, I'm good. I'm good. But then after a certain number of losses, sometimes if yeah. you're unlucky, they come to you and say, can I borrow like, yeah, because I'm going to make it back. So my thing is, oh, so you have a high risk appetite, but you have a low risk tolerance. Mm -hmm. <laughs> your appetite of taking risk is much bigger than your tolerance because <laughs> clearly you can manage these losses personally, right? You can't sustain these losses. So you kind of always use that to gauge. Okay, so good, good. you have a high appetite for risk, mm -hmm. but is your tolerance level equal to your appetite for risk? Mm -hmm. And I always use that analogy for people who like day trading. Yeah. Most day traders have incredible appetite for risk, mm -hmm. but I'm not sure they have the same tolerance for risk. They're, they're gambling, per right, se. That, right. That's usually right. what people say. Exactly. Oh, no, you know. Sh it, mm -hmm. Should we, that's interesting, should we be watching it daily? Uh, it seems like if you're watching it daily, maybe you're gambling. I'm not using that word, but should you be as much as, like I said, I'm old school, so I think put your money in at the end of the term, at the end of a few years, your your gains are going to be you're going to the market is going to beat wherever else you did. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm patient like that. Mm -hmm. But those people that say, oh, I made this mob today. I lost that. I, I made this. I mm -hmm. lost that mm -hmm. um, to sit around like that. It's, it can't mm -hmm. be too healthy for you. It, it can't be right. So so it's like Thanksgiving. Right. When you're the guy who goes to the kitchen every five minutes to ask if the food is done. <laughs> are you there yet? <laughs> you're not having a great experience. No, and and no. then the question is, are you really there for Thanksgiving? Or are you just, just there to create anxiety for yourself, right? Correct. In the process. Good because if you're there to have a good time with family and eat when the food is ready. You just sit down and wait for the food to be ready and they'll call you and they'll let you know. As opposed to going to the kitchen every five minutes trying to figure out when the food is going to be ready. Clearly, you're hungrier than you plan to be when you got there. Case in point is that, okay, investment is supposed to be for long term. Mm -hmm. There's really, there's not too many scenarios where investing strategies for you to make money from Tuesday to Thursday. Like it's, mm -hmm. it's not even a typical mm -hmm. direction to take, right? So if you check in every day, it tells me that you probably don't understand who you are in the scheme of the industry mm -hmm. because most people don't need to do that. You invest in for long term. 
yeah, maybe if you hear news about the company, maybe if you hear something, or maybe you get an email, or uh, you get some type of document from your brokerage, okay, you can read it and check on it. But it's not designed for you to check twice, three times a day. When you have those habits, then you have to really reel yourself in and ask yourself who you are. This mm -hmm. is my question last week. Mm -hmm. Who are you? Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Are you an investor or you're a gambler? Mm -hmm. Right? Once you determine that, then your behavior, you know, kind of shows accordingly, right? That's mm -hmm. that's the way I, I, I see it, and that's just my personal opinion. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's it's good to put it in that way of so you know we just said risk uh, risk aversion or risk tolerance versus risk appetite, but also knowing the way who you are, because there are people that when they're getting into investments, they kind of like to how do I say? They like to go into like a, spur, uh, a specific niche of investments, right? Because they think, oh, you know, I, I heard stocks and options make me a lot of money. Yes. So this is who I'm going to be. I'm going to be a stock trader. I'm going to be an options trader. And then there are people who, who hear, well, you know, gold and precious metals and commodities mm -hmm. make me a lot of money. This is who I'm going to be as an investor. I'm going to trade a lot into commodities and precious metals. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, same theory kind of applies to Forex. Especially crypto, because crypto being a uh, relatively new thing, we kind of saw a lot of people go on the internet and say, you know, crypto this, crypto right. that, you know, uh, Bitcoin is going to go to a million dollars, right. uh, Ethereum is going to hit a hundred thousand, so right. forth. So, you know, I, I kind of want to do talk a little bit. So we just discussed the pros and cons, but also the getting into these niches, right? Getting into these niches, but also not getting so into it that somebody or you know whoever is getting into it is undisciplined and makes uh, financially uh, unwise Bad decisions. Decision. Exactly. When, so that, let's touch on crypto just a little bit because I know all the young folks love this topic. <laughs> Bitcoin, right? Very popular. You hear it all the time. Mm -hmm. The total value of all Bitcoins in the world is still less than the value of one company in the U.S. stock exchange like Microsoft, mm -hmm. like Apple. It sounds crazy that Bitcoin is just a fraction of the market cap of those companies, right? Mm -hmm. But, you know, and it fluctuates, obviously. I don't know what the recent um, comparison is, but it fluctuates. But we've been... Uh, living in a generation now where things are marketed. So they seem bigger than, mm -hmm. they, than they really are. Is Bitcoin what most people will consider in a, a good investment vehicle? Probably not. People would think it's speculative, right? The speculative mm -hmm. investment is not based on anything. It's not based on any fundamental. Right? So it will be considered speculative investment. You're just hoping for a price change. That's what you're doing. Right. Mm -hmm. That's exactly. To, That's what I tell people all the time. It's speculative, right? So... I, I would be very reluctant to come here and say, you know, investment strategy, buy this crypto, buy that crypto. Mm -hmm. um, because my whole notion is that crypto is speculative and most people agree with, it, with me yeah, on that. That absolutely. it's speculative. There's no real underlying fundamentals to support the price. As opposed to a company like NVIDIA. Okay, NVIDIA is selling something, GPUs, that mm -hmm. there's a high demand for. So you could project out demand and you could project price and you could... See debt, you can look at the balance sheet, you can mm -hmm. make decisions based on fundamentals, right? Mm -hmm. Based on company performance, as opposed to 100% speculation. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, can you buy crypto if you want? Of course. If you want to use it as part of your investment vehicle, of course, it got approved recently. Oh, fine. Mm -hmm. Do you know my number two question every time someone tells me they have cryptocurrency? Do you know what my second question never fails? Can you guess what my second question always how, is by default? How, how much do you have invested? I was asked, <laughs> how much percentage of crypto is your total portfolio? Ah. Yeah, how much is it? Yeah. Yeah. Because, okay, you could buy it. When someone tells me, oh, my total investment portfolio, crypto is 90%, I'm like, wow. <laughs> that is incredibly brave of you. Listen, if you're 15, fine. If you're 18 years old, fine. If you're 40 or 45 or 35, man, I get worried. If you're 55, forget about it. I get really <laughs> worried. Um, because you may have the risk appetite, but man, you should probably don't have the risk tolerance um, mm -hmm. to keep dumping your money in a category uh, asset class that's so volatile and based on speculation. 
I don't know what the plan is. I don't know if that's even a retirement plan or just gambling at that point. But my second question is always, what's the percentage of crypto mm -hmm. All right. that you have in your portfolio relative to your stocks, your bonds, your other investment vehicles and everything else that you're doing? Crypto to me should be incredibly low. Mm -hmm. Depending on your age, obviously, right? Because mm -hmm. we always, we heard about the 60, 40, you know, portfolio. Yes. Crypto should be, I mean, I always even say as low as single digits sometimes when I'm trying to be conservative, right? Most people don't like to hear that, especially young folks don't like to hear that because they probably have a higher risk appetite than most older people. Uh, but at the end of the day, I normally say keep it low. Now, can you use it and mix it in as part of your investment strategy? Of course. But I, I think we should emphasize the fact that we as society has made this thing bigger than what it really is because the market cap of Apple and, you know, NVIDIA and all these companies is much larger than the total value of all the currencies of one specific mm -hmm. brand. Mm -hmm. I don't want to keep naming, naming names of cryptocurrencies, but that's the idea. Exactly. And, 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 it, and it actually had an interesting beginning. I don't want to get into it, mm -hmm. but the, the whole idea of it, you know, didn't have a lot to do with long-term savings. <laughs> it was mainly yeah. someplace to put it where no one could find it. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> put money where no one could find it. And then, so, so again, not strong fundamentals, mm -hmm. you know. And I can't go back to uh, more of what you said in the beginning. I want to make sure we say it loud and clear. You know, <clears throat> when you begin determination of your investment vehicles, what's the end game? Mm -hmm. What do you What are you trying to accomplish? You know, as you mentioned, you're 20. Mm -hmm. You may. Are you doing this for what? In your 30, why are you doing this? 50, why are you doing this? <laughs> you know, are we talking retirement here? Are we right, talking right. Are we talking about uh, buying a company? Mm -hmm. You know, are you talking about um, what What are you Are you talking about dividends? You know, mm -hmm. all the things that you spoke about. So, um, we have to continue. And I just want to, you know, we're. Um, as we draw even towards the end of the show, I want to make sure we go back and we say that mm -hmm. the first thing is you sit in front of a prof professional and they're going to ask you, you know, what do you want from this? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, what do you what do you, what's what do you want from this? And it's OK that your um, objective changes. You know, my objective at 25, maybe diff listen, there's nothing that changes your life when you drop those first kids. Right. <laughs> right. When you start having children, your, your risk appetite goes way down. It gets way down. <laughs> and you're thinking about their future. You're thinking about their college education. Oh, man. You know, it's but much different when you're just thinking about, hey, can I get that new shiny car? Mm -hmm. You know, when I'm mm -hmm. single, can I impress that young lady or that that gentleman? So mm -hmm. um, and so I don't want to go past that, that, you know, as as time goes on, we will change why we're doing things. Um, and that at that particular point, you know, kind of like when I first got married, it was it was cool mm -hmm. to live in a condo, two people, mm -hmm. right? Townhouse, two people. When you start having children, then you decide, you know, you can have a sports car then. Mm -hmm. And then you have a child <laughs> and you got to get a house with a yard mm -hmm. and then you got to get a, a family vehicle. Mm -hmm. And so I don't believe it's that much different when it comes to your investment Um it's you have to know what you want at a particular time, and then you choose the one that works best with your current goals. If I may, because I, I know this, this might draw, this one's going to be a complex question. Uh, and it's going to draw out a little bit the topic. But, uh, and for both of you, this is the, the question. In the corporate perspective, or in the corporate world, a, a small business compared to a more a larger, more well-established uh, corporation and the way they, they invest. And I, I mean invest not necessarily in terms of going into stocks, but the way they invest into different projects, the way they invest into themselves as, as a company. Because a large company has the resources to do it. A small company doesn't. They're very limited. What would be a a good mindset to have when it comes in terms of, you know, their risk appetite, their risk tolerance, uh, what investments should they prioritize? How should they diversify their investments? A, you know, should a small company focus on muscle power? Should a large company uh, focus on automating their processes to be more efficient and effective? Well, and I'll leave it up to Yinka to talk about specifically what's best for 
company is a corporation. But I will say this, one little piece. If you are working mm -hmm. for a company that invests in, in their employees, mm -hmm. for example, they offer 401ks, they mm -hmm. offer stock options, they offer matching funds, mm -hmm. right? Um, take advantage of it. Yeah, it's, 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 you're investing in your company, or they're investing in you, mm -hmm. and take advantage of it. There are many people that have worked at companies with, that had matching funds and never got involved in it. Mm -hmm. You're leaving 50% or more on the table. Okay, so um, if you are working in companies and they offer you uh, ways to invest, right? Mm -hmm. I think employees should take advantage of it. Uh, it's nothing they can necessarily take away from you. That's mm -hmm. yours. But in terms of, you know, where should small business put their money versus mm -hmm. a large corporation and, and those sort of things, I'm going to defer to you, Yinka. Yeah, I think you, you made a good point of people taking advantage of that. Um, we talk about investment strategy. I think one of the easiest ones to just relate to is if a company is offering you a 401k with matching, it's literally free money mm -hmm. um, you know, for whatever percentage of it's dollar for dollar, whatever the case may be. Um, now, to get to the actual question of what should companies be, be investing in, right? Mm -hmm. So typically, the stage of the company is what determines what they should be investing in, typically, mm -hmm. right? You have startups, you have growth companies, you have mature companies. There's different levels and you have different sizes of the companies depending mm -hmm. on the market capitalization. And you have companies that are not publicly traded and they're just trying to build enough, you know, either bandwidth or enough uh, processes or proof of concept to, to be able to increase their value, right? So from that regard, the stage is what determines what you should, what you should invest in as a company. Um, there's a point to, to what Professor Thompson said, that you should invest in your people, right? Um, because they're the ones who add the most value, especially when it comes to tech, right? As you all know, tech companies, uh, the value is in the people. That's why their programmers and the engineers get poached a lot, right? Because mm -hmm. it's brain power, it's knowledge. Now, if you're in a farming industry type company, um, you probably are going to probably want to invest in automation, right? You want to automate your process mm -hmm. and reduce your cost per unit, depending on where you are. If you're a startup, you're mostly going to invest in trying to get as fast as possible to some type, proving some concept mm -hmm. or getting, getting a, an MVP, a minimal viable product out of the process and using your, your cash to focus on that. And then after that, maybe you want to, as you grow, you want to invest more in marketing because now you've you know, had a product, now you need people to know about the product and you invest in marketing. But I, Along the way, you're still going to invest in your employees. I don't think investing in employees ever goes away. I think your corporate strategy may change depending on your size and depending on what stage you are in. Um, a lot of companies that are already fully mature, like Apple, invest in innovation and acquisition, right? Because mm -hmm. after a while, you know, you're either innovating what you already have or you're acquiring a new type of company to, you know, mm -hmm. make your exposure a little bit more um, broader. You're trying to diversify your offerings, right? And, and so... Again, it's a broader issue, but generally speaking, the stage determines what you invest in over a period of time. But you should always invest in your employees. I don't think you can get out of that. Exactly. I do know, um, it might not be an investment question, but it's a question I've always had. Um, I want to clarify. Um, small companies don't necessarily pay their bills with income, right? They pay it with some sorts of lines of credit, right? Yes, it depends. It definitely depends on the companies because a lot of small companies, when they start, they use a lot of line of credit. They use a lot of debt. They use, um, you know, investor funds, right? It's not necessarily revenues from sales because they right. don't have any sales, mm -hmm. right? They're right. still trying to build mm -hmm. the the product, right? Mm -hmm. So they they normally you have to make a decision on how you fund your companies, uh, especially when you're starting out. Um, either you're going to fund it through debt or you're going to fund it through equity. And both options have different level of, of risk. Now, people like us could come in. We're talking about investing, right? Mm -hmm. You could decide to invest in a company mm -hmm. by buying equity in a company. High risk because it's a startup. It has, has no product. You could, obviously, if you're an accredited investor, that's a completely different conversation. Mm -hmm. But let's just assume all of us are accredited investors. I know he is a accredited investor for sure. <laughs> Self-made millionaire right there. Because <laughs> a accredited investor, you need to have made, you know, over a certain amount per year. You need to have a certain uh, net worth to be an accredited investor. But that's, let's put that aside. 
but the, the point is that you can decide as, as an investor or a person to invest in this early stage companies um, either as a debt holder or stockholder. Mm -hmm. right? and, and those decisions play into what happens to you in the next round of investment or as a company grows, right? Mm -hmm. If you're a debt holder, you're capped at your interest rate unless you have a convertible note, which is a different conversation. Mm -hmm. But you can convert to stock. Most people like that option because the company just uh, goes, uh, you know, out through the roof, you benefit mm -hmm. from that. But typically, you're capped, but you also have a lower risk than an equity holder. Like mm -hmm. if me and you bought stocks in Professor Thompson's company and tomorrow it closes down, we have no, we have no recourse. Mm -hmm. we're, we're done. So we've lost it all. But the mindset of someone who decides that they're going to invest in a startup or accelerate, I remember that term when we were working together, um, accelerator companies, mm -hmm. um, how do they... How do they normally make that decision? Is it normally based on, hey, if I'm going to buy, invest in your company, um, I'm usually expecting returns greater than what? I, it, greater than the market? Greater Generally than, greater than the market. Right. Absolutely greater than the market. Right. And how do you edge yourself against the company? If you're investing in the company, um, uh, do you try to take out Profits immediately? Do you try to? Um, well, you can't. You can't, right? Most startups don't generate enough profit to distribute to investors. Correct. Period. Right. right. So you can't hedge yourself that much. Okay. From a individual company standpoint, the way either private equity or venture capital or some more seasoned investors hedge themselves is they will invest in ten startups because they know one of them. If okay. one of them is successful, it will cover the losses on the other. That's mm -hmm. as close you. as you get. I got you. Um, but you can't pull money out. There's hardly any liquidity. Mm -hmm. If you're lucky, if the company is mature, maybe you could sell it on secondary markets and get some money back. But generally speaking, you can't pull your money out of a startup. Uh, almost impossible. Right. Because uh, right. they did really have no money. And by the time you cut your check, they already spent. <laughs> so, and, and so, and I think it goes across the board. Diversity is always good. Mm -hmm. Diversity is always good. And knowledge is always good. This is why to invest in startups, you typically need to be what is called an accredited investor. And that's just a loose term for there's requirements, right? There's the requirements for who you need to be to invest in some startups. Mm -hmm. From income to net worth. Like, credit investor, so you need you to make it. So you can, um, you, could, you can sustain the loss. Exactly. Right. They're trying to assess your risk tolerance, your ability to take, to take risk, right? And not, not just your willingness to take the risk, but your ability to take the risk, right? So that's what that's trying to protect. Not like somebody who makes $5 an hour and they wants to invest all their savings into something. I think there's a level of protection there because that, that may not be an accredited investor, because the loss could impact that person negatively. Mm -hmm. So in, 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 in the sense of uh, you know, high risk, which is in the startup community, where they're not on the stock market, they're not, they're not traded, remember. And I'll close out with this. The reason for the protection is that you need to be more diligent when you're assessing a startup to invest in, as opposed to a publicly traded company, because publicly traded company has information that they have to provide, they have to produce mm -hmm. financial statements, you know, a lot of information, tank, they have a lot of things they require to produce. So you, there's more transparency with, with, with uh, these companies. They audited you know, X, Y, and Z. When you're dealing with startups, some of them, they have their financial statement written on a napkin. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you're lucky if you're getting an audited financial statement, right, mm -hmm. during the due diligence process. But as an investor, so we, so I like how we're closing out with this. <clears throat> we went from the stocks, you know, to the, to the mutual funds, the ETFs, and now we're talking about more complex, less transparent forms of investing, which is investing in very early stage companies. That requires a different skill set, definitely requires a different net worth mm -hmm. to get into that. And most students may not be there yet. Yeah, we hope every student gets there at some point. <laughs> or be, with the help of Professor Tom. Oh. There you go. <laughs> Get in there, man. <laughs> um, I, can't, I can't thank you enough. Um, this conversation is, is needed. And, and, and I'll say this, like I said, <laughs> if I knew then what I know now, things would have changed. And that's what we're trying to do here um, um, with the Bears and Bulls is that we're trying to um, spark conversation, um, things to look at in our community with our students so that at the end of the day, they um, can make wise decisions. 
and at least they can have that conversation. Right, right, right. Okay. Um, so, Jinka, I, I would like to to participate in in a question also. Um, I want to to I want to first thank you for uh, all the episode and and the insight that you have given. But I would like to ask three short questions just to wrap up the the episode. One, if you were to rank the the investing vehicles like uh, at, at a conclusion, what would be like your top three investing vehicles that you would recommend for beginners. Then my second question is, according to that ranking, how the trading psychology might affect your, your selection? You know, like how, how do you train yourself in trading psychology and how can it affect your game? Okay. And lastly, uh, but not least, you mentioned the, the word speculation while talking about crypto. And how, what's your insight on like the dollar not being backed by gold anymore versus Bitcoin, for instance, being a uh, finite supply that allegedly could increase uh, value? Good so, point. Good question. I love yeah. that last so, one. Basically, that's, those are my so, questions. So, so the first one for beginners, I keep it simple. I still go with stocks. I'll go with ETFs, um, you know, things that are traded on an exchange because there's a level of transparency that you need to start. And it helps you along the education process of the terminologies that you need to operate in, 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 a, in an investment uh, you know, space. So for me, those, those, I'll say, you know, ETF stocks, maybe, you know, throw, throw in, maybe throwing some uh, mutual funds in there. If I get a little bit more advanced, some, some mutual funds have higher requirements and you know, they have you know, different requirements and they have some fees, but those things are the typical ones because there's a lot more transparency when you're dealing with those types of investment vehicles. So to start up, you don't want to jump into this investment with more complicated things that's less transparent or that need a lot more analysis or industry-specific knowledge. You want to start with something that's more transparent just to get yourself acclimated. So that's my take, right? Now, the second question was, uh, what was the second question? Psychology. The psychology. The I, I think training. psychology goes to what I said, and I always, you know, emphasize this. I, I know I sometimes I overemphasize it, but understand who you are. You know, you can't be a, a football player playing basketball with football rules. Who are you? Are you a football player? Are you a basketball player? Mm -hmm. Are you a gambler? Are you an investor? You have to make that decision. And it's very easy to tell if you're a gambler. We just talked about the habits, right? If you have to check every two minutes the price of the stock that you bought, you don't sound like an investor anymore. Yes, yeah, to me. like people <laughs> might have like uh, a strategy or begin with a strategy and, right. and things don't go according to that strategy and they start things plunging and they get yeah. scared or they use probably a stop loss or exactly. and they don't accomplish the, the final goal. Exactly, because even, even if I wanted to have a strategy, I could set up a purchase I, I could put a cap on how much I want to pay for it, and we can get into those nuanced terminologies, right? And 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 design my 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 trades where I'm not embedded in the day to day minute by minute changes in the market because nine out of ten times I don't have the time. It's not my main course, so I'm literally creating an opportunity cost because I could be doing other things to earn income. So so for me, I always say know who you are because the key term that we should take away from here. You know, I know we're talking about risk appetite, but let's just talk about who are you? What is your risk tolerance? And your risk tolerance is your willingness to take risk versus your ability to take risk. Those are two different things. Decide who, what, what, that, what that is for you. And then you could decide what path you want to be in. But let's not confuse a gambling behavior to investing. They're very different. Investing requires a little bit more analysis. There's different ways to measure performance of managers. There's so much to it that we can't even talk about it today, but investing is completely different. You know, you know, people get lucky and they say, well, investing is easy because anybody get lucky. No, there's ways that fund managers are actually um, measured on how they perform. And there's formulas to do this, there's tools to do this, where even if you got lucky, it will be known that you got lucky, <laughs> right? So, so those, are, those, those are my sentiment um, around uh, deciding who you are. What is your risk? Tolerance, your ability to take risk versus your 
your your willingness to take risk and and decide where you fall in. Now, you made an incredible point on crypto versus um, the traditional dollar and the dollar not being backed by anything. Okay, I've heard that argument and people use that argument to support bit any cryptocurrency, mm -hmm. right? How is dollar created? We had a conversation last week mm -hmm. about our friends at the Federal Reserve. <laughs> There's a regulatory body that has an incentive to protect the economy. Mm -hmm. Whether we agree or disagree with their policy is completely different from an entity that's creating a currency through mining. And, and whether you want to get into the details, you know, proof of work versus whatever, mm -hmm. we could get into that another day. But clearly, there's two different interests here. And even though the dollar has an indefinite, quote unquote, printing capacity, <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. that will in turn reduce the value of the individual dollar, there's an incentive, you know, let's get into it, right? There's an incentive of the Federal Reserve to protect the value of the dollar. So there's lever, levers that's used both by the government and Federal Reserve to protect the value because obviously you don't want to overprint where now your Forex situation mm -hmm. is upside down. But no such thing exists in speculative market like crypto. I mean, I know you said Bitcoin, but what is the difference? What <laughs> what is the difference between the price of Bitcoin today and the price of Bitcoin three months ago? What exactly happened in those three months to justify the price increase? Uh, uh, there, uh, uh, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, please. Well, there's nothing that happened other than the fact that um, what people believe, mm -hmm. <laughs> sentiment, mostly sentiment, sentiment. right? There's no revenue. They didn't say we have a new projection that uh, mm -hmm. our Bitcoin corporation is gonna, corporation is going to make X amount of dollars or X amount of millions. What happened? You went through the pandemic. You had the issue with uh, you know with uh, one of those stock uh, uh, trading platforms, and you know uh, right, crypto yeah. platforms. Yes, yes. You know, one of them went under. We don't have to talk about the company. Right, right. And then you had the approval. Uh, uh, by uh, the regulatory bodies to uh, accept Bitcoin into more complex uh, publicly traded uh, you know, asset uh, configurations. And I'll put it that way without being too specific. I'm trying not to mention too much names here. Yeah. Um, but, but, but those things are driven by sentiment because at the end of the day, it is still um, a store of value. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so... I hear what people are saying because both can be created, quote unquote. I understand that Bitcoin has a maximum uh, number of uh, tokens that could be created. Um, and when it reaches the cap, it's, it's done. So maybe there's some scarcity uh, benefit there. Uh, but still, it's not driven by anything except for speculation and sentiment, where the currency, although we may not agree about the policy, we may not agree about the inflationary uh, behaviors of the Federal Reserve sometimes and, or, or the government sometimes, but we still know that somebody has a responsibility here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I was told by, um, it was a convention down here. They, we always have them down here, which, okay. is a, which is a cryptocurrency. This is like a little hub for having mm -hmm. these events. Um, and I was talking with a gentleman that was, you know, that's this is his industry and its market. And, um, and he was, I think he, and I don't want to over-exaggerate, I think he had told me like like in the last three or four you know three or four years that 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 there has been as much as seven hundred different coins introduced on the market that are no longer around right <laughs> so right. so you know in terms of i mean we're talking seven hundred you right. know um currencies currencies that have went away. Mm -hmm. And then people are asking me about the dollar. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> well, the dollar's still here, you right. know? Um, and many of these are not there. And, and honestly, with the uh, crypto market, I think there's only two that I know of that have, have lasted quite a bit. And we both know their names. Right. And we don't have to get in. But think about it. Close to, you know, six or 700 are no longer here. Um, again, because what is it based on? What principles are these based on? Other than... 
And many of the folks in those marketplaces, they focus so much on, on the, um, the fact that, you know, your bank, can tr not having your bank track you. Right. you know, they're more focused on, the, you know, the platform right. um, that it's on right. um, than it is about the currency itself. So right. again, again, when they get proper principles and we understand, you know, how they make their money, then it could be a way to go. But right now, I've never seen a reason to go in that direction. And, you know, it's because I know we, we kind of have to start wrapping it up a little. We've been here for about an hour. We've spoken, uh, you know, a plethora of amazing topics mm -hmm. from different forms of investing to, you know, the pros and cons. Uh, the, as you mentioned, we've mentioned that a lot, the, the risk appetite versus the risk tolerance, right? Mm -hmm. What are you willing versus what are you able to, to actually take in losses. Mm -hmm. uh, we even just discussed a more uh, advanced uh, manner of protecting your investments, hedging, right? diversifying, right. knowing what to invest and don't pick the, the exact uh, same vehicle, maybe uh, pit one vehicle against another to protect your assets and your wealth. And you know, we just went over to the, uh, the three wonderful questions that uh, right. were the the manpower and the the, the brain behind the entire yeah. operations back in the fish tank just <laughs> asked you know the psychology of of investing versus or you know as well as the the well not so much the future but the way cryptocurrencies and bitcoin have performed so you know again to to wrap it up I'd, I'd like to say thank you Yinka thank for, you. I don't know if I answered all your questions on the third <laughs> one did, did I cover the 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 Question for you, uh, when it comes to the Federal Reserve printing uh, currency versus uh, Bitcoin mining? <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, uh, I still think it's a huge topic as all the questions that we have in the episodes. Yes. But um, yeah, certainly there are, there, there is, uh, I, I mean, I wanted to know your opinion on it and certainly get clear. Mm, yeah. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Again, yes, uh, thank you, Yinka, for all the knowledge uh, and your time here for willing to be or for being willing and to time. to share all this information. Thank you. This is fun. fun. Awesome. I, I, I'm just happy to be here. <laughs> <laughs> so, so again, thank thank you so much. Um, again, a wealth of knowledge, conversations that we need to be having, um, and I and and thank you again, Angel, because. Um, we do this for you. We do this for the students. And having students here, um, sometimes I don't know what's going through their mind, the things you're thinking about. And if 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 half of our students are as up to <laughs> knowledge base as you are, we have a great future, right? So um, hopefully the questions you're asking, the things that concern you, um, resonates with all our students at Atlantis University. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.